What's up guys? Hope you're having a good day. UFC Fight Night Gamrot vs Fiziev is an amazing card with loads of interesting complex fights top to bottom and in this video we're going to be taking a deep dive into the five main card fights from a betting perspective. Most of the matchups we're going to be discussing today are very interesting from a betting point of view so hopefully you'll be able to use this information to make better betting decisions maybe even earn some extra cash and i also want to talk to you guys a little bit about live betting in play betting which is my speciality as you can see from my profitability chart here we perform really well at it making a profit most months and i just wanted to share some statistics with you guys that some of my members have dug up by analyzing our past performance so i want to start off with some amazing work that dober has done and you can see here that we actually have made a profit on 75 percent of fight night cards since 2021 so doba didn't go as far back in my profit and loss record as the next person i'm going to show you he only looked back to 2021 but the fact that we make 75 or make a profit on 75 percent of fight night cards i think is pretty incredible and it means that if you watch the UFC every single weekend live, you could probably get quite a lot of value out of joining my live betting group. If we take a look at some more stats, I want to say big shout out to Demon Slay Svet, who did some analysis on my performance from, you know, over basically since I started out. You can see some interesting stats here. So on average, we only tend to have two losing months in an entire year so 10 of the 12 months in a year we're going to make a profit on average and only have two losing months which again i think is pretty brilliant and the chance of us having two consecutive losing events in a row is only seven percent so we perform extremely well on live betting it's my bread and butter and i think you get a lot of value out of it and absolutely love it if you gave it a try so if you want to give it a try, all you need to do, come to my website, mmabettingtips.com, link in the description below. Once you get to the homepage, scroll down, click where it says in play membership, you can give it a try. If you don't like it, I don't think that'll be the case, but if you don't like it, no problem, send me an email and we'll get you refunded. No problem, but I think you'd like it, so give it a try. Now, let's break down the first fight on this card that I want to talk about which is going to be the main event between Mateusz Gamrot and Rafael Fiziev. An incredible clash of styles and a very, very interesting matchup. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Fiziev is the favorite at average odds of around 1.63, which is going to be minus 159 for an implied probability of 61%. If we take a look at the odds on Gamrot, we can see that he's an average of 2.30 which is going to be plus 130 for an implied probability of 43%. So Gamrot is 32 years old, 5 foot 10 with 70 and a half inch reach. Rafael Fiziev, 30 years old, 5 foot 8 with a 71 and a half inch reach. So nothing major in terms of the tail of the tape there. Very interesting clash of styles this. You've got Gamrot who's primarily a grappler. You've got Fiziev, primarily a striker. I think everyone agreeing, or everyone watching this can agree, that if the fight stays standing, it's probably going to go very well for Fiziev. If the fight goes to the ground, Gamrot's obviously got a big advantage there. So the main focus of this breakdown is talking about how likely it is that Gamrot will be able to take Fiziev down and keep the fight on the ground for long enough to win this matchup. So, the real difficult part about betting this fight is that both guys are pretty inconsistent. And when you've got one fighter who's inconsistent, it makes it difficult to predict the outcome of their matchup because you don't know what version of them is going to show up. When you've got two guys that are inconsistent, it makes it even more difficult because you then have... A situation where you can't really trust what version of either guy is going to show up you know if one of them is inconsistent but you have a pretty good idea how the other is going to look then you can kind of you know work out most likely outcome when both guys are inconsistent it just turns the fight into a minefield from a betting point of view 
So before we get into talking about how these two match up stylistically, I really want to talk about why I feel both of these are very inconsistent and why that adds a huge layer of risk to bet in this fight. Start off with Mateus Gamrot. So Gamrot is a guy who I feel people have really struggled. Or I, I feel Gamrot is a fighter that the community, the MMA community as a whole, struggles to kind of assess his capabilities accurately. And I feel a big part of this reason is because he's inconsistent. So you've got one group of people that will look at, you know, fights like Gamrot's performance against Taz Rookian, where he looked absolutely incredible. And they will look at that fight and think that Gamrot is a potential future champion. And you know what? Based on that performance, I can see why he looked great against Taz Rookian. But then there will be another group of people that will look at his performance against someone like Benil Dariush and just think the guy's an absolute bum, right? And the problem you've got is that both groups are kind of correct in their assessment of Gamrot because he shows very different sides of himself in different matchups. And the problem we've got when betting on Gamrot fights is now we never know which version of him is going to show up. We can identify most likely outcomes, like most likely versions, but still... When we know Gamrot is capable of performing like he did against Taz Rukian, it does make things a lot more difficult. Because if you look at Gamrot's career as a whole, for me, the one thing that has consistently let him down throughout his entire career, even dating all the way back to KSW, was that his cardio just isn't good. And people will argue and debate this until the end of the world. But ultimately, if you go watch his fights against Jalen Turner... Benil Dariush, Carlos Diego Ferreira, Scott Holtzman, Guram Kutataladze, and pretty much any KSW fight where he was forced to work hard early and the fight went deep. You'll see, around about the midway point in every single one of those matchups, Gamrot's volume starts to drop, his body language starts to look pretty sloppy, or his body language starts to look pretty tired, he becomes very sloppy, mouth open wide, breathing heavy. So Gamrot's cardio in most of his fights is a big issue for him. And, uh, you know, it's going to really start to cost him as he starts to face this higher level of opponent. In my opinion, it did cost him against Armin Tazruki. And I think this was one of the worst decisions of 2022. I've watched this fight three or four times now. And every time I watch it, you know, it's another one of those fights where it's actually just impossible to score that fight for Gamrot. And there are any scoring criteria uh, that has ever existed. He just lost. But we know what the MMA judges are like. They're awful. Uh, but we've obviously spoken about this in the past. His cardio then let him down against Benil Dariush. But what was interesting about the Taz Rukian fight was that it was pretty much the only fight I've ever seen of Gamrot's that went past round two where he didn't gas out. Gamrot looked absolutely phenomenal against Taz Rukian, and even though it's a win on paper, he did lose this fight. But it's one of those fights where a fighter lost, but actually looked incredible in the process of doing so. So when it comes to Gamrot, we're now in a situation where if Gamrot shows up and performs like he did in any other fight that I've ever seen him in, he's got a real tough fight on his hands against Fiziev. Like, Fiziev will likely cause him big problems. But if Gamrot shows up and performs like he did against Tazrukian, I think he absolutely dominates Fiziev. I barely give Fiziev a chance here. Because for me, if you take the best versions of both guys, the best version of Fiziev we've ever seen, the best version of Gamrot we've ever seen, Fiziev is just completely incapable of beating the version of Gamrot that fought Tazrukian. The problem is that it's very rare... Gamrot performs like that. We've only ever seen him perform like that once, right? And what's interesting about this matchup is there's kind of two ways to look at it. Where we're trying to predict what version of Gamrot we're going to get this weekend, on one hand, you can say, well, if that's the only time we've ever seen Gamrot perform that well and not gas out, then it's far more likely 
we get the version of him that fought Jalen Turner, Benil Darius, Carlos Diego Ferreira, Kuta Taladze, Holtzman, and that he will gas out this weekend against Fiziev, right? My problem with that is the Taz Rukian fight was a five-rounder. All the others were three-round fights. So did Gamrot not gas out in that five-rounder because for some reason he just trained harder, ate better, you know, for that five-round fight? And will he perform like he did against Taz Rukian again this weekend? Because once again, this is a five-rounder. Is Gamrot one of these guys that trains differently for three-rounders versus five-rounders? And that's the reason why he looked amazing in the only UFC fight that went five rounds and has looked pretty fucking average in every fight that went three rounds in the UFC. I don't know. So there's like two ways to look at it, right? Now, we've talked a bit about Gamrot inconsistencies. We've got to talk about Fizzy Ebbs as well. Because, again, we're going to focus on cardio. His cardio looked pretty good against Rafael Dos Anjos in a fight that was contested at a pretty high pace. He also went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Brad Riddell through a very high volume of strikes and didn't slow down at all. Even though, again, that was a very fa fast-paced fight. But then if you look at Fizzy Ebbs fights against Bobby Green... And Justin Gaethje, he did slow down quite a lot in those fights. And so, this matchup is, is really complicated because we don't know what version of both guys we're going to get. Like I say, what I do know is if the best version of Gamrot, the best version of Fiziev show up, pretty confident that Gamrot will get the win. But with both of them being inconsistent, it's tough, tough to gauge how it's going to go. So... What I want to do is a little bit complicated to break down how these two match up from a stylistic point of view without knowing what versions of both of them we're going to get. But I'll try and give a general perspective on what I expect from this fight based on the two different versions of, of the fighters that could show up. Now let's start with Fiziev because to be fair to Fiziev, he's a lot easier to work out. Um... In my opinion, his cardio, if you look at his entire body of work as well, is better than Gamrot's. Gamrot's cardio against Taz Rukian looked amazing, but in every other fight in the UFC, it's looked awful. And in many of his fights in KSW, it's looked awful. I wouldn't say Fiziev's cardio has ever looked awful, but he does noticeably slow down as the fight progresses. And so, based on past performances, when this fight starts on, on Saturday night, I think Gamrot is going to find it extremely difficult to take Fiziev down. Fiziev has got great balance. He's very good at reading his opponent's takedown entries. He's great at getting underhooks in play very easily to prevent his opponents from taking him down. He's very good at using the cage as a base to defend takedowns. And when you do take him down, he's very good at quickly popping back up to his feet. Gamrot has absolutely amazing takedown entries. Gamrot has some of the best double leg takedown entries in the division. But Gamrot's problem is that he's not the most physically imposing grappler. He doesn't have the best grappling control. He's not particularly good at holding guys down. This is why if you go watch his fights against guys like Benil Dariush or Scott Holtzman or Guram Kutataladze or Armin Tazrukian. He doesn't actually get much uh, top position or grappling control in those fights. Because every time he kind of takes those guys down, they are able to work their way back up to their feet relatively quickly. Sometimes longer than others, you know, might have taken Kuta Taladze 40, 40 seconds to a minute. Might have just taken Scott Holtzman 10-15 seconds. But ultimately, he doesn't have the most physically imposing grappling very good takedown entry struggles to get grappling control when you see him rack up a lot of top control on guys like Jalen Turner it's because guys like Turner are awful off their back as soon as he faces someone like a Darius a Tazruki and a Holtzmer or a Kuta Taladze that can scramble he finds himself in a lot of trouble and Fiziev is definitely more aligned to those guys he's pretty good at creating space for himself off the bottom scrambling back up to his feet so early in this matchup I think Gamrot is going to struggle 
because I don't see him being able to take Fiziev down and hold him down, which means he's going to have to stand and strike with Fiziev, where we know Fiziev has got a big advantage. He's got an amazing kicking game, um, inflicts big damage to the legs, big damage to the body. He's got great combinations, legit one-shot knockout power in his hands. And while Gamrot's striking is improving a lot, he held his own against Tazrukian. He's just not at the level that Fiziev is. However, I don't think this is going to be a particularly easy fight for Fiziev on the feet. Because Gamrot is one of these guys that's a very intelligent fighter. He knows his strengths and weaknesses. He knows his path to victory. So Gamrot is probably not going to be foolish enough to stand right in front of Fiziev in kickboxing range. Gamrot's one of these guys that will most likely want to be all the way outside of a range where he can be hit, or all the way on the inside working the takedowns. Fiziev, generally speaking, is a guy that wants to stand in the middle of the octagon in kickboxing range. He's not particularly good at pressuring you or cutting the cage off. And so Gamrot may not be in huge amounts of trouble on the feet, because he may not fight in a range where Fiziev is going to be able to attack him and land on him that easily. Having said that, this fight is in the apex center, which is obviously a small octagon, which means Gamrot isn't going to have loads of space in there to kind of circle away from Fiziev and avoid engaging. So it'll be easier than it would have been in a big octagon for Fiziev to cut the cage off, trap Gamrot, force him to fight in an uncomfortable range. So... It ain't going to be a picnic for Fiziev on the feet. You know, Gamrot's footwork and movement will make life difficult for him. But, you know, it, it's one of those fights where you'd expect Fiziev to do pretty well if it stayed standing, especially early. So this is one of those fights where if Gamrot shows up and performs like he does in the majority of his fights, I think he is going to tire himself out by spamming a lot of takedowns and not achieving a lot with them because I think you'll find it difficult to get Fiziev down and hold him down. And while I do think he will also tire Fiziev out in the process, I think Fiziev's takedown defense is good enough to still keep the fight standing if both guys get tired at the rate that they usually get tired in most of their fights. So if Gamrot shows up and performs like he did against Dariush, Turner, Kuta Taladze and Holtzman, I think he throws the kitchen sink at Fiziev with grappling early, doesn't achieve a lot, and then in the third, fourth, fifth round, I think Fiziev starts to take over and light him up. And both guys will be tired, but the difference is Gamrot will be too tired to get the takedown. But, remember what I said about inconsistency. The last time we saw Gamrot in a five-rounder was when he fought Armin Tazrukian. And he looked absolutely incredible. He sprinted for five rounds, barely slowed down at all. I don't know what the hell Gamrot did differently for that camp. But it, it was like a completely different version of him showed up. It was like his fucking triathlete twin brother showed up. Right? Unbelievable performance. If that version of Gamrot shows up this weekend... Fiziev is absolutely screwed. Because if we get that version of Gamrot, the Fort Tazrukian, what you're going to see is Gamrot use a lot of grappling early, which will wear Fiziev down to the point where when Gamrot keeps coming hard with his grappling like he did against Tazrukian in the third, fourth, and fifth round, while well, Fiziev will do a pretty good job of neutralizing the threat of Gamrot's grappling in rounds one and two. By the time you get to rounds 3, 4 and 5, when Gamrot is still being relentless with the chain wrestling, still relentless with the double leg entries, grinding up against Fiziev against the cage, Fiziev will just be too tired to keep this fight standing. And we kind of saw this late on in the gamrot Tazrukian fight, where towards the end of the fight, Gamrot started to have more success with his grappling, because he'd worn Tazrukian down earlier in the fight, to the point where Tazrukian's defensive wrestling just wasn't as sharp. He just didn't have the energy anymore. And Tazrukian's cardio is an order of magnitude better than Fiziev's. So what does all this mean from a betting point of view? Well, 
it means the fight is a bit of a minefield to be honest with you and certainly not a fight that i would be betting simply because there's no way to know what version of both guys will show up and without knowing that you can't really feel confident either way there's going to be loads of people with really strong opinions on how this fight is going to play out but what you find about these people is that they will have a little bit of tunnel vision and if they really think Fiziev's going to win this weekend it'll probably be because they'll focus in on those matchups where he's performed really really well against guys like Brad Riddell or Rafael Dos Anjos and they'll forget the fact that he really didn't throw much in the second half of the Justin Gaethje fight and slow down bad against Bobby Green they'll have those rose tinted glasses and they'll be very selective with the fights that they judge Fiziev on and similarly if you've got guys that are very confident Gamrot will win this weekend it's because in their mind all they can think about is Gamrot you know driving Taz Rukin into the cage in round four and five and chaining loads of different takedowns together and being absolutely relentless with his grappling and they'll completely forget about when you know he was looking extremely tired early in round two against Carlos Diego Ferreira and if it wasn't for a weird injury to Ferreira Ferreira he was on his way to swinging momentum in his favor or when you know in the Darius and Jalen Turner fights Gamrot was looking very tired after just six or seven minutes um it's one of those fights where you have to be a critical thinker you have to be very open-minded look at the big picture and understand that both guys are very inconsistent and and they've both got a lot of layers to them and, and, and both guys have got strengths and weaknesses that the other is pretty well positioned to exploit. So in my, my opinion with this matchup, there's no strong position on either side. It's an incredible fight. I'm very much looking forward to live betting this one. Um, I can't wait to see what happens. I hope the best version of both guys show up and then we're going to get an incredible matchup. But for me, I can't bet this. Now let's refresh this page to make sure we get the latest odds and let's take a look at the over under on this one so the over under is in the even money odds range uh, i would agree with that both guys are absolutely tough as nails i do lean more towards this fight going the distance more towards the fight going over just because both guys have proven how difficult they are to put away they're both tough as nails they're both very well rounded um, even when they get tired they've still got the heart of a lion it's not easy to get them out of there but 25 minutes is a long time and I wouldn't feel great about betting the over in a 25 minute fight so I'm going to pass on the over and uh, my lean is over I'm not going to be betting it though in terms of my uh, pick for a prop let's take a look at what we've got let's take a look yeah, the odds. I, I'm not too keen on the props, man, because it's because it's very difficult to predict what version of either guy we're gonna get. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one. It, it, it's a very very tricky one, man. We will give that a miss. So I hope you found that breakdown useful. Now let's break down the co-main event, which is a great fight between Dan Ige and Bryce Mitchell. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Bryce Mitchell. Is a pretty big favorite at average odds of around 1.48 which is going to be minus 208 for an implied probability of 68 percent we take a look at the odds on dan ige he's around an average of 2.65 which is going to be plus 165 for an implied probability of 38 percent so dan ige is 32 years old five foot seven with a 71 inch reach and Bryce Mitchell, 28 years old, 5 foot 10, with a 70 inch reach. So both guys roughly the same age, roughly the same size. Obviously, Bryce Mitchell will be a little bit longer and taller, but Ige with that small, compact, muscular frame has got that big power in his hands. And it's a very, 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 very interesting matchup, this. Super interesting. Uh, another classic striker versus grappler matchup. I know that Dan Ige in his gi here technically he has a base in brazilian jiu-jitsu but obviously dan ige's biggest strength is his striking he's got very nasty leg kicks big power in his hands true legit one shot knockout power and as a result if this fight stays standing he's going to do very well i would even go as far as saying that if the fight stays standing mitchell has virtually no chance of winning 
doesn't really have any power in his hands not particularly technical not particularly good defensively and obviously we know Mitchell's cardio is a real issue where if you make him work hard he slows down quite quickly we saw him slow bad against Ilya Topuria and we also saw him slow bad in his uh, Ultimate Fighter Finale matchup against Tyler Diamond. There have been a lot of fights where Mitchell hasn't slowed, like against Barboza, uh, Charles Rosa, etc. But Mitchell tends to be one of these guys that is very good at being the hammer, not so good at being the nail. A little bit like Grant Dawson in many ways. He's not as good as Grant Dawson, but guys like Mitchell, guys like Grant Dawson are very much like Damian Meyer, where when they are allowed to be in total control when they're the hammer they don't really slow down right if they're able to come out get you down obtain a dominant position and just kind of dominate you on the ground then they're going to be in total control they can control their breathing control their heart rate and while the fight's very comfortable for them while they're in control they're not going to slow down but guys like bryce mitchell grant dawson damian meyer they slow down very quickly when they're forced to be the, the nail, right? When they're not able to dictate the pace of the fight, when they're not in control, when they're forced to react to what their opponent is doing, when they can't get the takedowns, when they can't obtain the dominant positions, that's when they slow very, very bad. So we kind of saw that in Mitchell's last fight against Top Uria. We didn't see that in his fights against Barboza and Rosa, right? It's because it really comes down to how in control Mitchell is and whether he can dictate the pace. So the real question here, if we know Dan Ige has got a big advantage when it comes to striking, is whether or not Mitchell is going to be able to dictate the pace and totally control this fight. And for me, it's a very interesting fight because Ige is one of these guys who I feel has a lot of self-destructive tendencies in the sense that his takedown offense could be good. He could work his way back up to his feet quite easily a lot of the time that he gets taken down. But Ige is one of these guys that, because he's got a base in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, he tends to give up takedowns pretty easily. And if you put him on his back, he doesn't show a lot of urgency to get back up to his feet. He's one of these guys that will kind of lie on his back, hunting for long shot submissions, without showing a lot of urgency to scramble back up to his feet. And that would be a big mistake against Bryce Mitchell, because Mitchell has got really good offensive wrestling and incredible grappling control. So Mitchell has absolutely got the wrestling to take Ige down and absolutely dominate him on the ground. But we know Mitchell's going to slow. We know Ige's got a big advantage on the feet. We know Ige's defensive wrestling, takedown offense, ability to scramble back up to his feet can be very good. But mentally, he quite often chooses to stay in bad positions. So, my lean on this fight is very much Bryce Mitchell. But I would never feel comfortable betting on a guy like Mitchell as a big favorite who can't go hard for three rounds. Mitchell's cardio is a real issue. And I just don't feel it's smart to bet a big favourite when they have a bad gas tank. Because if Ige actually tries to keep this fight standing and actually tries to work his way back up to his feet when he gets taken down, he can cause Mitchell a lot of problems. Because if Ige makes Mitchell work hard on the ground to keep these dominant positions early, you could see a situation in the second half of the fight where Mitchell's just too tired to take, take Ige down, which is almost what happened in the Andre Philly fight, but Philly kept giving up cheap takedowns. But for all you dog chasers out there, I do want to show you a little clip. And I actually had these ready, and for some reason, my links have disappeared. So let me just grab a link to Ige's fight against... Uh, we will show you his fight against Korean Zombie because I feel this illustrates it the best because Korean Zombie is not a particularly good grappler. Certainly nowhere near the level of Bryce Mitchell. I mean, it's not fair to say Korean Zombie's not a good grappler. He is, but he's not known for his grappling, right? Bryce Mitchell, much stronger grappler than Korean Zombie. So if I show you a little bit of footage from this Korean Zombie fight, you will see why this could potentially be a very, 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 very difficult fight 
for Dan Ige. But the problem is Bryce Mitchell's cardio makes it very tough to trust him. So if we bring up this Korean zombie fight, and I'll just show you very, very quick clips. We don't want this breakdown video to be super duper long. Controlling position. We don't want it to be super duper duper long. In fact, I might just show you the first round because it'll illustrate the point I'm trying to make. Now, we all know how good Bryce Mitchell's offensive wrestling is, how heavy his top game is, how good his grappling control is. So take a look at this sequence here. So Korean Zombie shoots a nice double leg there, drives through, gets the takedown. So there's 2 minutes 45 seconds left to go in the round. Plenty of time for Ige to try and work his way back up to his feet. If we skip through, you can see that even though he does create a lot of space for himself off his back with this active guard, he doesn't use the space that he creates for himself to try and scramble. Like Even little sequences right there, right? He kicks off on Korean Zombie, creates space, but instead of trying to explode back up to his feet, he stays on his back. And so Korean Zombie is basically able to hold him down you know, for a good minute before Ige then eventually scrambles. But the thing about Ige is he just waits way too long to scramble. And if we go through the fight, again, I don't want to make this super long. But there's more examples. You see here towards the end of round two. Legs too close together up against the cage. Zombie goes to a single leg. And I don't know what Ige was thinking there. It looked like he was trying to attack with a Kimura or something. But gives up a very, very cheap takedown. Ige makes up a lot of mistakes like this. And now look, he's got his back taken. With 30 seconds left to go in the round. So Ige makes a lot of mistakes like this. And we know Bryce Mitchell with his crushing grappling control. Heavy top game. He's the kind of guy that can really make you pay for this. So we don't need to go on any longer there. I feel I've made my point. Uh, what does all this mean from a betting point of view? Well, Bryce Mitchell definitely deserves to be favoured. I do lean towards him. But I'm not interested in betting on a big favourite with a bad gas tank. So this one's an easy pass for me. Would I take a gamble on Dan Ige? For me personally, no. Just because for me, Dan Ige's biggest weakness is his takedown offence and ground game. And Bryce Mitchell is very well positioned to exploit that because that's Bryce Mitchell's biggest strength. So for me, the fight is a minefield and an easy pass. Now, in terms of the over-under on this one, obviously it's more likely that the fight will go to a decision because if Bryce Mitchell's favoured here and we expect him to have a lot of success with his grappling control, but we know Dan Ige is a high-level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt that trade for a long time with Khabib, even if Mitchell gets, sorry, even if Ige gets dominated on the ground, we know he's skilled enough to defend himself on the ground. But with how dangerous Mitchell is on the ground, with how dangerous Ige is on the feet, I wouldn't feel comfortable betting on this fight to go to a decision again. That one, easy pass for me, no strong positions for me. Now, in terms of the prop bets on this one, in terms of the props, Mitchell by decision is the most likely outcome. But. If you are the type of person that wants to sprinkle a little bit of money on every fight to make watching more interesting, Ige to win in round 3 at odds of 14.0 plus 1,300 might not be a bad bet. You might want to sprinkle a little bit on that. Uh, it's not a bet I'm going to be placing, but I could see that hitting. And with how wide the odd or how, how, how juicy the odds are, you don't have to have a particularly high win rate to make a profit on those kind of bets long term. The reason why that is interesting to me is say for example Mitchell has success with his grappling early but Ige is able to make him work very hard on the ground for position. If Mitchell gasses out midway through round two like he does in a lot of his fights and then Ige is able to keep the fight standing after that with how dangerous Ige is on the feet, the knockout power he has, Mitchell will be at risk of being stopped on the feet late in the fight so if you're the type of person who wants to bet a little bit of money make watching the fight more interesting e-game round three you could do worse than that so i hope you found that breakdown useful 
Now let's talk about the next fight, the rematch that never, never, nobody actually asked for. But it's Marina Rodriguez versus Michelle Waterson. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Marina Rodriguez is the favourite at average odds of around 1.32, which is minus 313 for an implied probability of 76%. We take a look at the odds on Waterson Gomez. She's around an average of 3.50 which is going to be plus 250 for an implied probability of 29%. So Rodriguez, 36 years old, very old for a straw weight, 5 foot 6 with a 65 inch reach. And Michelle Waterson Gomez, 37 years old, also very old for a straw weight, 5 foot 3 with a 62 inch reach. So we can see that Rodriguez, longer, taller and more athletic and physically imposing than Waterson. And we saw those... Um, you know those advantages of being more physically imposing have a big influence on their first fight when Michelle Waterson Gomez lost a pretty one-sided decision now that fight was in the flyweight division this fight is in the strawweight division but I really don't see the outcome changing that much if this fight stays standing Rodriguez should be able to chip away at Waterson outpoint her and win very comfortably Waterson's only real shot in this is if she can come in with a grappling heavy game plan don't know what that noise was do apologize but Waterson's only chance in this fight is if um, she comes in with a grappling heavy game plan and can take Rodriguez down in two out of the three rounds now based on her first fight she did have a bit of success with her grappling but it isn't the easiest to get in deep enough on the legs and hips of Rodriguez to take her down. She's strong. Her balance is pretty good. Um, if you get Rodriguez down, she's very easy to hold down. But it's not easy to get inside and grab a hold of her. So it's possible that Waterson could steal a decision here by having success with a lot of grappling in two of the three rounds. But the most likely outcome is Rodriguez will be able to keep the majority of this fight standing, chip away at Waterson, win a comfortable decision. From a betting point of view, the matchup is absolutely dead because Rodriguez is a big favourite. So not much upside in betting her. And with how bad she is off her back, knowing Rodriguez, uh, knowing that Waterson will have the advantage on the ground, if she can get it there, for me, there's no way you can bet Rodriguez. And the fact that she's already beaten Waterson by a pretty one-sided decision shows she's very likely to get the job done again this weekend. But her odds are absolutely terrible. And they reflect her advantages in this fight. With how the first fight went, with the fact that Waterson Gomez is now 37 years old, got no interest in betting her as a big underdog, this fight's an easy pass. Now, their first fight went to a five round decision, didn't really come close to ending inside the distance. Both girls have got, uh, you know, really good cardio, they're both tough as nails. Very, very, very likely this fight goes the distance, but the odds reflect that. And not much upside in betting. Uh, at odds of that 1.30 dead 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 now in terms of props the only prop that i would consider is marina rodriguez by decision but again the odds are not particularly enticing for a prop 1.65 pretty dreadful this fight very 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 easy pass now let's break down the next fight between Brian Battle and AJ Fletcher. One of the most interesting fights on the card and it's a very, very complex fight. So if we take a look at the odds, we can see that Brian Battle is the favourite at average odds of around 1.54, which is going to be minus 185 for an implied probability of 65%. If we take a look at the odds on AJ Fletcher, he is around an average of 2.50, which is going to be plus 150 for an implied probability of 40%. So AJ Fletcher is 26 years old, 5 foot 10 with a 67 inch reach. And Brian Battle, 29 years old, 6 foot 1 with a 77 inch reach. So you can see that there is a massive 10 inch reach advantage in this fight for Brian Battle. And statistically, fighters win around 70% of the time, 7-0, when they've got a 10 inch reach advantage over their opponent. So that is one hell of a statistic, one hell of a trend. In Brian Battle's favour. And it is also worth noting. That Brian Battle obviously started life in the UFC. 
as a middleweight, but has dropped down to welterweight, and he's absolutely massive for a welterweight at six foot one with a 77 inch reach. For context, we see this kind of wingspan, this kind of sized fighter with that height and reach in the middleweight, uh, not middleweight, in the light heavyweight division. So Brian Battle wasn't a small middleweight. He was actually a, a, an average size middleweight. And now he's absolutely enormous at welterweight. The downside of that is that the weight cut to 171 pounds at welterweight is absolutely brutal. Uh, which is probably the reason why he missed weight for his last fight against Gabe Green. AJ Fletcher is actually on the smaller side for a welterweight. Um, being 5 foot 10 with a 67 inch reach, that's kind of a wingspan that you'd see in the lightweight division. So here you've got Brian Battle, who is one of the biggest middleweights in the division, facing AJ Fletcher, who is going to be on the smaller scale of welterweights. We know size matters in MMA. We know physicality is a pretty big deal and those are areas where battle should have the edge. Another area where battle is going to have the edge is in both cardio and striking. We've seen Fletcher slow down in his fights against both Ange Lusa and Matthew Semmelsberger and we know that Brian Battle is an absolute cardio machine, can sprint, can go hard for three rounds, never slows down and so the longer this fight goes the better it gets for battle. On top of that He's got a pretty big advantage on the feet. He's not the best defensively, but he does have a very good chin. He fights at a high pace and throws way too high of a volume for Fletcher to be able to keep up with. Unfortunately for Brian Battle, his takedown offense and ground game is an absolute joke. And it is difficult for me to quantify how bad his takedown offense and ground game is. You kind of need to see it for yourself. So... Let's take a look at the footage, the only place that you will find truth and honesty in this game so that you guys can see for yourselves. So, let's bring up his fight against Fak Redinov. Now, yes, I understand that Fak Redinov is a combat sambo guy, very good offensive wrestler, very good MMA grappler, but for me, very important to understand that it doesn't matter the level of a fighter someone is facing, you can assess their level of skill by the skills they demonstrate in the octagon. And even though Fak Redinov is a very good grappler, Battle's takedown offense is a joke. And it doesn't matter whether Battle is fighting Khabib or Hannah Cyphers. At the end of the day, when your takedown offense and ground game is this bad, Battle could even run into trouble against someone like Vanessa Demopoulos. So let's take a look. And you can see here, very early on, Fak Redinov shoots a double leg, gets Battle down. Battle goes straight to the closed guard. Now, what do we want to see a fighter do in this position? Well, we want to see Battle show a lot of urgency as soon as he hits the ground to try and create enough space for himself to pop back up to his feet. Doesn't do that. Goes to closed guard and just basically does very, very little for the first minute that he's on his back. And you can see Fak Redanov just kind of holds him down for the entire round. Now, what isn't great about this is that Battle worked his way over to the cage a while ago, right? You can see he gets the cage here, which was about a minute after he'd been taken down. But it still took him almost two minutes to use the cage to wall walk back up to his feet, which is far too long. And then when he eventually does get back up, Fak Redanov just sweeps his leg, gets him back down again and again. Hits a nice little outside trip here. I mean, look at how bad Battle's takedown offense is. And again, very, very weak off his back. Don't want to make this breakdown video super long, so we'll skim through. But I just need you guys to appreciate how bad this guy's takedown offense is. Round two now. In fact, we're enough. Shoots a double leg. There he goes. Battle goes down. Strongest. The wind is enough to take this guy down. And again, he's relatively close to the cage. Should be doing a far better job of using the cage to wall walk. But Fak Redinov just holds him down very easily. And people look at a fight like this and they'll go, oh yeah, but Fak Redinov's a way better grappler than AJ Fletcher. Correct, he is. But it doesn't mean that Fletcher can't still score easy takedowns and rack up a lot of top control on a guy that is very easy to take down and hold down. Like even here, battle attacks with this choke. Just gives up top position. Not a great idea to do something like that 
to a combat sambo guy. So I don't need to show you more footage. I think I've made my point. Um, what? How? How does this impact this fight from a betting point of view? Well, personally, I think you'd have to be absolutely insane to bet Brian Battle at odds of 1.5 for uh, minus 185 in this fight. In, in order for me to bet on a fighter in this odds range, they have to have an advantage over their opponent pretty much everywhere and no major weaknesses. The last time we bet a fighter in this odds range was when we bet on Yasmin Lesindu to beat Pollyanna Viana. And for the most part, she absolutely dominated. She had better cardio, better striking, better grappling in the granite chin. I don't mind pulling a trigger on a fighter in this odds range when they tick as many boxes as Yasmin Lesindu did. But ultimately... Until Brian Battle improves that takedown defense, he's impossible to bet on. Because any able-bodied professional MMA fighter that he goes up against has a true, real and legit chance of beating him because the guy cannot keep the fight standing. And if you take him down, very, very easy to hold him down. Now, it's a tricky fight for betting because I don't like the idea of betting guys with bad cardio and Fletcher does slow down as fights we're on. There's also the potential the battle could have improved his takedown defense in recent fights and so with his size advantage as well that can make it very difficult for Fletcher to take him down we also know the battle's got a big advantage when it comes to striking but Fletcher even though he's not the best offensive wrestler not the best grappler we did see him use grappling in the Semmelsberger fight he's more than capable of getting battle down and racking up a lot of top control so this fight very tricky one for betting in my opinion it's a i'm sorry to be boring but ultimately you know i need to make this very clear when i pass on a lot of fights like this there'll be naysayers like oh you suck yada 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 all these guys you suck you never place a bet blah 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 uh, at the end of the day motherfucker we've only had two losing bets on loose pre-fight bets in the whole of 2023 and the way in which you maintain a high win rate and make a profit almost every fucking month is not rolling the dice on fights like this where you've got two very deeply flawed guys there will be people that want to bet battle this weekend because he's big and he's strong and he's exciting and he hits hard and they think Fletch is a bum that's going to gas out but ultimately battles take down offense and ground games a joke and so how the fuck can you bet him as a big favourite? It just doesn't make any sense. You're not putting your money in a strong position. And equally, even though Fletcher's a live underdog that can certainly have a lot of success with his grappling in this fight, Battle's got a huge size advantage over him, much better cardio, and he's a significantly better striker. So the way in which you perform at this level, like we have in 2023, where we've only had two losing months in 2023 is you stay really patient and you wait for those opportunities where the bookies completely fuck up and they give you an opportunity to bet fighters who have major advantages over their opponents everywhere. Guys like Sandeni or uh, Taylor Santos, not a great example, uh, but Yasmin Lesindu, right? Justin Gaethje, Miranda Maverick, these kind of bets. And we won't win them all. You can't win every bet. It's impossible. You're going to take L's. But by staying patient, waiting for those really strong positions to come to us, we can maintain a high win rate. And whenever we do dig up a strong pre-fight bet, it means we can bet it very aggressively. We can put big money down on it because we're very confident in our edge and our ability to perform extremely well over the long term, maintain a very high win rate. That's what we're trying to do here. And neither of these fighters tick those boxes. So it's a very easy pass. Yes, I'm boring. Yes, I suck. All that kind of good stuff. I couldn't give a fuck though. Because all I care about is money. And this year has been a good year for us. So AJ Fletcher, Brian Battle, easy pass. In terms of the over-under, um, I don't see this fight go into a decision that often. Just, actually, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. It's not appropriate for me to say that. I'm quite torn on the over-under. I could see it go in the distance if Fletcher comes in with a grappling heavy game plan, slightly better cardio than usual, and he could just take Brian Battle down, lay him, pray him, hold him down, grind out a boring decision win. 
But if the fight stays standing, if Battle can't get, sorry, Fletcher can't get Battle down and take him down, I don't see this fight going the distance. I think Battle kills Fletcher on the feet. So I'm very torn on the over under, which is probably why it's, you know, the odds are relatively balanced. I don't have a strong opinion on the over. Uh, I would pass on that. I don't really, uh, I don't really know. In terms of the prop bets on this one, uh, there's a lot of different ways this fight could go. Battling round three is interesting to me because we know Fletcher will slow down. Especially, you know, battling round three is interesting to me at big underdog odds, especially if Fletcher has, you know, some success with his grappling early in the fight, and then he's too tired to get the takedowns late on. Then Battle could put him in a lot of trouble late on and maybe get a late finish like we were talking about in the Bryce Mitchell Dan Ige breakdown. So I might want to go Brattle in round three. I'm not going to be betting that myself. Outside of that, some more for you to think about. Uh, Fletcher by decision, those odds aren't great. Uh, battle by knockout at TKO. That's not bad. That's not bad. Battle, very, very dangerous striker. But yeah, lots of different props to consider there. Hopefully I gave you some ideas. I'm not betting any of them myself. I like to be very protective of money these days. Pre-fight betting is going amazing. Football betting is going well. UFC live betting, you know, make a profit almost every month. So no need to fuck about and put our money in danger on bets like this, which uh, we can't be too confident in. Hope you found that useful. Now let's break down the final fight that I want to talk about today. Let's break down the fight between Ricardo Ramos and Charles Jordan. Let's get into it. So, if we start off by taking a look at the odds, we can see that Jordan is the favourite. Average odds are around 1.70, which is minus 143 for an implied probability of 59%. We take a look at the odds on Ricardo Ramos. He's around an average of 2.15, which is going to be plus 115 for an implied probability of 47%. So, Jordan is 27 years old, 5 foot 9 with a 69 inch reach. Ricardo Ramos, 28 years old, 5 foot 9, 72 inch reach. Both guys virtually the same size, virtually the same age, but very different styles of fighter. Another classic striker versus grappler matchup this. Charles Jordan, the exciting, explosive, aggressive, violent, mean, nasty striker. And Ricardo Ramos, even though he's more well rounded, does a bit of everything has a base in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and his strength here certainly is grappling. So striker versus grappler matchup. If the fight stays standing, Ramos is absolutely screwed. Jordan is going to outstrike him by a wide margin, light him up and cause Ramos a lot of problems. If this fight stays standing, Jordan's going to win very, very comfortable. But we know that Jordan's takedown defense and ground game, just like Brian Battles, is an absolute joke. Now don't get me wrong, Jordan's takedown offense is better than Battles. He's a bit better at working his way back up to his feet, but still very, very, very bad on the ground. And again, best way for you to appreciate where I'm coming from is to see the footage for yourself. Because ultimately, the only way you find truth and honesty in this game is by looking at the fight footage. So what I want to show you is Charles Jordan's fight against Nathaniel Wood. And you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, there will be some people that will be like, well, hang on a minute, Allsop. How the fuck, how the fuck can you say this geezer, Charles Jordan, has got terrible takedown defense and no ground game when he destroyed the grappling phenom, Crone Gracie, in his last fight? Well, the answer to that question is, quite often, the only way you're going to get fighters down at this level is if you shoot in deep, on your opponent's legs and hips, which Crone Gracie cannot do. All of his takedown attempts come from above hip height from the clinch with funky th throws and shit. Because a guy like Jordan has good balance, he's very athletic, it's not easy to upset his balance if you go in on takedowns above hip height. To take a guy like Jordan down, you need to get in on his legs, his hips, and upset his balance that way, which is exactly what Nathaniel Wood does. Which is exactly what Crone Gracie can't do, but is potentially what Ricardo Ramos is going to be able to do. If you watch some of his fights against guys like Bill Algio, for example, go and check it out. So anyway, let's take a look at this fight here and you will get to see how bad Jordan's takedown offense and ground game is. So here, Jordan throws a kick. 
and Wood is like, thank you very much. Oh, no, he, he goes to hit an outside trip. So he hits an outside trip. And you can see Jordan goes down very easily. But you guys know me. It's not a deal breaker if you have bad takedown defense, right? I don't care. It doesn't bother me. It's not the end of the world. I don't mind if you have bad takedown defense. As long as you're able to work your way back up to your feet quickly. Which Jordan can't do. Similar to Brian Battle. It just looks completely hopeless off his back. Lies on his back. Doesn't really make much of an effort to get back up to his feet at all. So Wood's able to hold him down, rack up, you know, around two minutes of top control before eventually Jordan gets back up. And then, if we keep going, where is the next bit of grappling? Are we going to round two? Here we go into the second round. So you can see here, again, Jordan's going to give up a very cheap takedown in a second. And the difference between Wood and Prone Gracie is, again... Wood is getting in on the legs and hips of Jordan, which Ricardo Ramos can do. So he sweeps the leg there with a kick, gets into top position. This time, he kind of lets Jordan up. He gives him a lot of space to just stand back up. If we keep going again here, Nathaniel Wood, little trip there, very nice. And just look at how easily Jordan's going down, how easily he is. The hold down. Awful off his back. Very, very bad. Should we keep going or are we going to make this too long? One more and then we done so. So again here, little trip gets him down easily. Pathetic, 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 pathetic from Jordan. So, Ricardo Ramos isn't the best offensive wrestler, but he does have nice trips and throws. Back belt. He is a decent MMA grappler. He has decent grappling control. So this is one of those matchups where both guys have extreme advantages in the area that the other is weak. If the fight stays standing, Ramos is going to get absolutely smoked and Jordan will dominate. If the fight goes to the ground, Jordan is going to get absolutely smoked and Ramos will dominate. So the question is, can Ramos use enough grappling in this fight to win? Difficult question to answer. Ramos isn't a natural grappler, but when Jordan's takedown offensive ground game is as bad as it is, almost anyone in the division is capable of beating him with a grappling heavy game plan. So again, this is not the type of fight that is smart to bet on. There will be some people that will be very confident on Charles Jordan, and they haven't done a single minute of research on this fight because it is very foolish to bet a guy like Charles Jordan in a matchup where... He's facing a guy that can absolutely take him down and dominate him on the ground. And then there will be other guys that are going to bet Ricardo Ramos. And they would also be very foolish and have also not done a single minute of research on this fight. Because we know in the past Ramos has had a tendency to slow down. His grappling is not the best. And we know Jordan is an absolute dog on the feet. That If he can keep it standing or if Ramos chooses not to grapple that much, we know Ramos is going to be in a lot of trouble. So this fight, impossible to bet, could go either way. Best to save your money for live betting. Hopefully you're in my live betting group. And if you are, good chance we can make some money this weekend because we make a profit on 75% of USC Fight Night cards. So if you're in my live betting group, pretty good chance we're going to make a profit this weekend like we do most weekends. If not, save your money and don't force bets on fights like this because there's no strong positions to put your cash. So I hope you found that useful let's take a little bit of a look at the props i don't think i'm going to lean too heavily either way on the props don't have a strong opinion on the over under you can make cases for it going either way because jordan's submission defense is pretty bad so if ramos uses a grappling heavy game plan i could see him submitting jordan ramos slows on the feet and we know jordan's got that killer instinct with his strike and he's very dangerous on the feet so you see jordan getting a finish on the feet but at the same time, you know, both guys are pretty well-rounded as well. So, I think it's more likely the fight ends inside the distance. But I'm not interested in betting it. If we look at the prop bets. If we look at the props. Um, Ramosh by submission. Jordan by knockout or TKO. Those are some interesting ones to me. Uh, Jordan by... Uh, Jordan to win in round three as well. The odds should be pretty wide on that. In fact, Jordan to win by knockout or TKO in round three. Uh, odds of 15.0. Very interesting. It's unlikely he would submit Ramos. 
15.0 plus 1,400. I'm not going to be betting the props. I don't like props. But if you like betting a little bit of money on every fight to make watching it more interesting, those are some options for you. Hope you found that breakdown useful. Thank you very much for watching. If you did, please hit the like button. If you didn't, please hit the like button anyway. And subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great weekend, guys. Enjoy the week off with no UFC. We've had 19 consecutive weeks of UFC events, which is why this video is a little bit late being update, uh, uploaded. My brain is frazzled. I need a couple of days off without watching face punching. It's been a grueling stretch. But we'll be back for the next event in about a week's time. Have a brilliant week with your family, guys. Enjoy it. Enjoy life. I love every single one of you for watching. Take care, everybody. Like and subscribe. Nice one. See you all very soon.